Hello, my Geesling Legion. Your ranks are swelling, which makes this Mother Goose Robinson Earhart uh, very happy. Today, I talked with L.A. Paul, who is the Millstone Family Professor of Philosophy and Professor of Cognitive Science at Yale University. Lori, as I'm sure many of you already know, is best known for her work on transformative experience, where she identified a novel and really striking problem in decision theory about how we're supposed to reason around situations and make decisions on a rational basis, where at the end of the decision, we end up a drastically different person than we started out. So how are we supposed to decide based on our current values, whether or not we should become a vampire or become parents when after having had that experience, we will be an entirely different person from the, the one making the decision. But before this, Lori did her initial philosophical work at Princeton under the guidance of the one and only David Lewis, where she wrote and thought about causation and time. And lately, she's been exploring the intersection between cognitive science and metaphysics. So we talk about Lori's background. We talk about the problem she identified in transformative experience and some of the objections to her account as she initially gave it and how it's changed over the years since her book on, her book with the title Transformative Experience was published. And then we also talk about how cognitive science has informed and impacted the metaphysics of time and causation that she initially started working out on. So lastly, uh, thanks so much for listening, uh, following me on social media or I mean, I just started twist, Twitter, the Twitter, or subscribing or following wherever you're listening to this. That all really helps a lot because I'm enjoying this and I, I want to keep doing it. And <clears throat> the more listeners I have, the more views these video gets, views these video get, uh, views these videos get, make me makes me not only happy, uh, but it makes makes it a lot easier to get great speakers and wonderful guests like Lori on the podcast. So I, I love this conversation and I hope you do too. So I see that you went to undergraduate though for biology and chemistry. Yes. And, and was that for pre-med? Like how did that turn into a PhD in philosophy? Um, so, I mean, what happened was I'd always really sort of enjoyed science when I was in high school. And then I started taking science classes. And I was, yeah, maybe thinking maybe pre-med. Uh, my parents really wanted me to be a doctor. Uh, so I started taking especially chemistry classes, and I really liked them. Um, just really liked the problem solving. I loved organic chemistry. And so I thought, okay, I'll be a doctor. You don't or hear that maybe, often. Like, you know, keep studying chemistry. Um, and then... I don't know. Um, it was at, uh, it was sort of through a mix of both naivete, like not really knowing what it would be like, like not having any idea really what you know working scientists do. Um, also taking a lab that I absolutely hated, um, uh, involving gravimetric analysis, which is incredibly detailed, super anal like measurements where you spend months doing tiny little things and measuring tiny little differences and if you mistakenly brush your finger against the clay that you're measuring, you know, months of work are destroyed. And of course I obviously brushed my, like I have no, like I don't have a lot of physical dexterity when it comes to material things really like the theoretical stuff. Not so good with like little, you know, mechanical things or anything close to that. And so I just thought, Oh God, I can't do this. This is just a mistake. Um, at least I couldn't become a chemist. I thought, and I just, the biology would just kind of, was fun, but not my main focus. I really liked the problem solving. Um, and then on top of that, I thought, but actually I really like philosophy. And don't ask me where I got that idea from. I had never read a single philosophy paper. Didn't even read a popular <laughs> philosophy book. 
I had no idea about what philosophy involved, but somehow I thought it's got to be for me. Um, then I tried to take a philosophy class. It was like a philosophy of law class and did extremely badly. That didn't deter me though. Somehow I thought, oh, it's just the professor. It wasn't me. <laughs> um, so that's not me. That's how we all felt in undergrad. <laughs> so I went to my, my chemistry professor and I said, I've decided I'm going to drop out of chemistry and go do philosophy. I'm gonna, and, I, and I shifted schools and he got really angry at me. He said, you're making a mistake. And um, I said, well, so be it. So I'm not really sure I answered your question, but that's basically how I had like sort of, you know, a series of like confused steps and got me, got me into, oh, mm -hmm. and, and then um, what I did was I ended up going to <laughs> college, which I loved. Um, cause you could do whatever you wanted in Antioch and they would call it like, as long as you sort of thought about things, you could get a grade for it, or actually they didn't have grades, but you would get a, um, an assessment and, um, ended up doing, oh, no, I did an undergraduate degree in chemistry cause I decided that the chemistry program was much more rigorous than the philosophy program. Cause at the time doing philosophy at Antioch seemed to consist of meditation exercises. Some guy did for a senior thesis, he did a photo mobile, um, and I was like, this is not what I was thinking of when I thought about doing philosophy. So I graduated with a chemistry and biology, double biology and chemistry degree, and then went and did a kind of independent master's in philosophy, which also was weird in its own way, involving writing to various philosophers and offering to pay them money to read what I was saying when, like, about their books. Some of them very graciously said yes. Um, and... Then I took that material and turned one of them into a paper that I uh, used to apply to graduate programs. And a few of them wrote me letters of recommendation, even though they'd never met me. And I got in. I don't think I would ever get into grad school like today. I just, I mean, I, you know. Completely... It was a miserable experience. It was like, <laughs> but... yeah, and it was just crazy. And the thing is, I didn't have any, like I'd never taken a philosophy class, um, like a professional, like an official philosophy class. I'd done these kinds of, unofficial classes. So I got to grad school and I'd never had a logic class. I'd never had a philosophy of language class. I'd never had any history. Um, and so it was um, stressful at the beginning. <laughs> and well, you mentioned uh, when you started answering my question that you didn't know what it would be like to be a scientist, which kind of foreshadows where exactly. some of your work went. But it looks like a lot of your initial work was in the philosophy of time and causation. Yes. Were you initially attracted to those areas because of the science, your scientific background? Um, so I was initially, the work in philosophy of time um, was, first that was, I was just naturally very deeply interested in understanding the nature of the self in time. And like the book I'm working on now and the stuff on transformative experience and work on temporal experience and also the metaphysics of time all comes from that. Like really, I'm just fascinated by that question from a whole bunch of different angles. So that was like my first stab at it. And also the person that I was uh, working with most independently was in, had written in philosophy of time. So I actually was able to talk to somebody who helped me, like taught me some of the basics and explained. Who was that? Quentin Smith. Okay. So his name is Quentin Smith. He's actually kind of a character. Um, he he died a few years ago. Um, he was a very interesting and unusual person. Um, he had a he was a self taught philosopher. He got into uh, some trouble because he got in a big fight with um, uh, with Saul Kripke, um, um, defending um, Ruth Bark and Marcus's work in philosophy of language. We can't really go into that because I didn't fully even understand the details when I was um, studying with him, but. He's not unknown <clears throat> in the discipline. And he's also done some very interesting work in phenomenology and the nature of time and in uh, cosmology and, and also work on um, uh, uh, philosophy of religion. Um, so he's a very smart guy, but very odd. This is a man who decided that he needed, because he needed to get like, to be at more at one with the universe. He went and dug a hole in a beach and lived there for like weeks um, until finally, <laughs> finally he got really That's sick awesome. and someone dragged him out and like made him go to, yeah, he was like, he was, he was very authentic in a certain way. And I love that because, um, I was looking for somebody who was really interested in deep, big questions. And I didn't think he was the most rigorous thinker in the world. He was, you know, it was kind of apparent to me that he was a little bit off the wall, but he was also quite brilliant in lots of ways. And he wrote this book called the felt meanings of the world, which, um, um, is a kind of neglected classic in some way. Um, and so anyway, so that was my initial 
kind of introduction. And that was who, that was like, oh, and he'd also worked on Heidegger and in, in, in kind of continental philosophy in various ways. And I knew that I was very interested in these kinds of questions, but I also knew that I wanted to do them from a quite rigor or from a rigorous point of view, what I felt was a rigorous point of view, uh, like in the analytic style. So not the continental philosophy. And I'm guessing that not my thing, you know, so uh, and, and I'm guessing that working with David Lewis or being oh, around exactly, David Lewis. Exactly. So, so there's the science. Right? Impact, right? So it's like I'm interested in I'm interested in time and I'm, I'm interested in like in how we experience time, but also like in the phenomenology, but also in the science of it. Um, and also interested in thinking about things from a kind of, if I, you know, from as precise a way from a kind of very, I don't know, conventional in some sense, analytic perspective, not conventional in some sense, but conventional in another sense. Right. I just didn't feel like when mm -hmm. I worked through being in time, I felt like I at once understood, but had no idea what was going on. And I just couldn't, couldn't work that way. Um, so I have great respect for this other way of doing things, but it wasn't for me, um, so I remember actually, and I went to, um, this is slightly disjointed, but I also like went off to India to study meditation and think about whether I want to study Buddhist philosophy, um, decided no, that also wasn't for me, but I remember I was living in a monastery and I was sitting in this little cell that I had been living in. And I was like, I need to go to grad school for analytic philosophy. So I wrote to Quentin and I said, I've decided I'm going to apply to Princeton <laughs> and a few other places. There was no like you know, there were no online assessments at the time. Um, uh, the only way that the, the way that I found out about where to apply was um, I had done this before I went to India. I went down to the library, the bottom of the library um, in the basement of Antioch College, and they had these things, these blue books called I think it was like Robinson's Guide or something or Robert's Guide. I can't remember what it was called, but they, I remember there were these blue leather bound books. And what they had was like a listing of all the different graduate programs and um, um, for the for different like universities, right? So I looked up philosophy and it listed all of the program, all, all of the universities that had graduate programs in philosophy. And then it listed the percentage of people accepted at each graduate program. So I looked and found which were the, had the, had the lowest acceptance rates. And I applied to the, those 15. And Princeton mm -hmm. was at the very top. And then, and Rutgers was like right below it at the time. Um, and, and Yale had, was listed, although it, as it turned out, Yale didn't actually even have a graduate program. Had, Yale had gone into receivership, so there was no graduate program available. They took my money. I applied. <laughs> they never mentioned why, like, um, I never heard back. Um, and I was rejected. I was accepted everywhere, except Yale, which didn't have a program, or, or by Harvard or MIT. Harvard wrote back and said, you have no philosophy background, so you can't possibly be considered. So you're not like you're you're rejected. And I was like, and I was like, I had a lot of nerve because I'm like, I know I don't have any, I don't have, I know I have no any of your requirements, but I'm applying anyway. Because I took the GREs, I did very well on the GREs. Like I knew I had good numbers, and I had, you know, like I had the science stuff. And I was like, okay, why not? And then MIT, MIT just, you know, panned me right away. But then everywhere else said yes, which was great. Um, and completely yeah. un unexpected. So, so yeah, then I went to Princeton yeah, to work with Lewis. <laughs> practically be a celebrity if you got into all those programs today. <laughs> yeah, today. It, well, yeah. I just don't think, I think most of them would be more like Harvard. And, uh, and, uh, and I had this paper that I had worked on with Quentin, worked on very hard. Um, but I also think that it was kind of raw. Um, but David, actually, I found out later, David had read my application and, um, and had liked the paper. And so that's why I got into Princeton. And then I revised that paper um, and worked on it with him and then published it in Synthes. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was my first publication. While you were still in graduate school? Yeah, I published seven papers while I was still in graduate school, which was completely weird. At the time, nobody published. In fact, it was like seen as a mistake. Right, right. Um, but I didn't believe in that. I thought that was false. And, um, um, and also, I'll just be frank, I was a woman doing metaphysics and I had to prove myself. So mm -hmm. um, that's awesome. Yeah. So that's great. <laughs> uh, now, and, and I promise we're going to get to the philosophy, yeah, but yeah, no, the, your career arc is, is very uh, <laughs> is interesting to me. So then you started in science, then you went to causation and time. And then what prompted the switch to? decision theory or uh -huh. epistemology, okay. depending on how you, how it's looked at for transformative experience. Okay. Well, so let me actually just, so, so I did time, I didn't do causation until I was in grad school. 
And I got into causation because David was really interested in it. He taught a seminar on causation, a grad seminar. And I was in that seminar and so was um, Jonathan Schaffer. And that's where we met and became friends. First, we argued all the time. We were not oh, friends. Oh, awesome. I'm going to talk yeah. to him soon. Oh, good. No, Jonathan is awesome. He's, he's my oldest friend in philosophy. Uh, second to that is Ned Hall. Um, no, Ned is probably my oldest friend. And then Jonathan is my second oldest friend because Ned I met when I was a first year graduate student. And I think I was a second year graduate student when I met Jonathan. Um, but um, it was just this kind of great seminar. And after that seminar, I wrote a paper for that seminar. Um, and, um, and I sent it off to David because David had gone off to Melbourne to, for the semester. Because at Princeton, they're very kind of loosey-goosey. Like you can you write a paper and if you want to take a seminar, you can write a paper. It doesn't matter. You don't have to write a paper for credit. You have to write a, a certain number of papers. Um, but you don't have to write papers for seminars. You just have to write papers. So you can come up with as many different papers as you like. And you don't have to take any seminars at all. It's very flexible. So I wrote this paper. And then I remember get, I got this fax because David used there was, he didn't use email, but he faxed things back and forth. So he faxed me and he said, this is a very interesting paper. And I thought, oh, I've said something useful. Um, maybe I'll keep writing. And then I, I have more things to say. And then I wrote another paper on causation and I gave it to David and he, and he liked that one. I mean, like that one. I mean, it was always like this, like I would pose something and he would have all these devastating arguments and I would have to like figure out answers to his devastating arguments. But by the time I was done addressing his devastating objections, I had a paper. Um, and usually by the time I had addressed all of his devastating objections, there was no referee in any journal who was going to say anything that was, that was any worse than David had said to me. So I would send it off to a journal after talking to him for several months. Of, um, and anyway, I wrote three or two and a half papers, um, on causation. I said, David, I was thinking like, I want to like, you know, do my dissertation on something. And he said, well, you've done a dissertation. You've got almost three papers. I was like, but it's only like a hundred pages of work. And he said, it's about quality, not quantity. And I said, okay. So I finished yeah. the third paper and I was done. <laughs> so I kind of backed into the, the causation thing, but I really liked it. I felt comfortable with it. And it was mm -hmm. definitely, again, feeling really comfortable with um, thinking about like the nature of science and being very comfortable. I worked in labs and a lot of problem solving. And it was just at the undergraduate level um, with a little bit of research here and there, but it was still... Um, a way I'd engaged with doing science in, a ve in, in, in the way that a scientist would. And I think that just gave me a, um, a kind of affinity for these kinds of questions. So anyway. Uh, but, the, but then, so my last question was, what prompted the switch then to uh, decision theory or uh -huh. uh, epistemology or however you want to look at it for right. uh, transformative experience? Well, what happened was, so remember when I said way back, I was really interested in phenomenology and like the nature of the self in time. I've always been interested right. in that. And, and the reason right. why I wrote, like I wrote my dissertation on causation and worked on that for quite a while afterwards and wrote a book with like, actually edited a book with Ned Hall and Jessica Collins and wrote another book with Ned Hall on Ned on causation, which was really the kind of like, you know, a recap of like many years of conversation that we had had and exchanged with other people is I thought, you know, I really like this and I wanted to do this because I felt like it trained me in a certain way, very rigorously to work through these problems, but it wasn't getting at what I had originally gone, like I went into philosophy because I wanted to do something that I found personally meaningful. I mm -hmm. really, again, I'm really interested in kind of straightforward metaphysics. I always have been. And I think being clear about the metaphysics and the epistemology, but especially the metaphysics is I think really crucial for questions about like how we understand the self and the world. But I also thought that um, phenomenology with a small p, in other words, like the nature of experience was incredibly important. And that analytic philosophers seemed to be afraid of that. Like they were just afraid of talking about this. The only way you were allowed to talk about experience was if you were talking about the hard problem. Um, and I was like, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot more to say about this. This is much more that's interesting. And, you know, and I saw a lot of conversations again, like in so-called continental philosophy, where I thought people were really grappling with deep, important questions. Um, but I also thought that like the kind of more, you know, that my favorite analytic approach would give things a different spin and maybe uncover something. Okay. So then, so I was feeling this pressure. Um, and this sense of wanting to do something like to do something that involved like the nature of experience. Uh, and then I had a baby. Um, and cause I got, you know, like got married, had a kid 
And I was sitting around, not sitting around, I was, I was, I was breastfeeding my daughter. Um, she's like three months old. And I'm like, just sitting there like, you know, sort of <laughs> first few months, everything was a blur, but then I had sort of gotten enough sleep. And so I was like sitting there breastfeeding her. And I'm like, you know, that was an utterly bizarre experience. And it's completely rebuilt like my relationship to this myself and to others and like in general in the world, like many things are the same, but then many other things are different. It's like, this is incredibly important, both like epistemologically and also like metaphysically. And meta like, I've never seen anyone talk about anything like this in any of the work that I've like, that I've read in like, you know, um, both like some of the history, not that I'm so, I'm not a historian, but I had to read some things like at least for graduate school and I've done some teaching um, at Yale. Like um, some of my er early teaching was like with the moderns and stuff like that. So it's not like, you know, I hadn't read any history and I certainly didn't see any conversation about like having babies and, you know, the way it changes you in standard epistemology or metaphysics. So I was like, okay. I need to talk about this. I'm just going to talk about this. Because also I was like just about to get tenure. I was like, I'm safe. I don't, you know, what, what can they do? Because at the time, <laughs> I mean, okay, not only am I like, you know, woman doing metaphysics, right? Like it's, it's better now, but at the time it was, you know, I would like, I have been given many papers where I would stand up in there and there were like, I was the only woman in the room or only a couple of women in the room. Then we all got, then a bunch of people go out to dinner and be like me and like seven men. <laughs> You know, it was just, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't ideal. Um, well, now I'm going to go and like talk about having babies. Like that was, that was, that felt bold. Um, I was actually pretty scared, you know? Um, and so I started thinking about it and like something, you know, thinking about this question. And then I thought, you know, here's the way to do it. I'm going to make it into a decision theory problem because I actually think like, so what I'm really interested in is the nature of the self and how we rebuild ourselves through these experiences. And also how, um, like, like, as we know from, you know, like whatever, Mary in the black and white room or whatever, um, certain like kinds of experiences just can't be like, you have to experience them to kind of understand their nature and character. And I also think that they unlock content. So I was fascinated by that which came out of the debate about consciousness, but I just thought people had, were just talking, they, they had missed like something I thought was really important about that discussion. And then also just was really super interested in the metaphysics that involved all of this, like rebuilding the relationship between self and world. But I knew if I started talking about it like that, that people would just like either shut off or, um, or the issues I wanted to get to would get lost. So I'm like, I'm going to do this as a decision theoretic problem. And as I started thinking about it as um, a decision theory problem or a problem in um, a certain kind of formal epistemology, I realized that there were actually quite distinctive issues with decision making. And it wasn't that I wasn't aware of them at first. It's just that like they came into much more precise focus by thinking about, um, by trying to kind of frame it decision theoretically and also by thinking about really the, the epistemology in certain ways. We'll tell you one other story. Um, and that is... Um, in conjunction with all this, I'm thinking about this. And then uh, I was visiting um, the Australian National University and they had a conference. Um, and a bunch of us went out to dinner afterwards. It was like, this, you know, everyone's out to dinner and we're all drinking wine. And I'm sitting around the table. There were six, I think six people there, mostly philosophers of mind. And the question turned to like having kids. And of course, I'm a new mom, you know, and I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm, you know, I think it's like kind of amazing, but I, but I, but I have to say that, you know, um, I could have also not had children. And there was a woman sitting across the table from me. She's like, you know, I'm not really sure if I want to have children or not. I'm really thinking about it. I'm like, oh, well, it's not a rational decision. You can't know what you're getting into before. You know, and I sort of ran this whole line. And there was another person there who had just had a kid too. And he started laughing and he was like, and, and so half the table, like basically was arguing with me. Like, no, of course these can be rational. Of course you could know. But he was sitting there cracking up because he'd also just had a kid and he completely got what I was saying. And so we had this whole, we spent like an hour kind of arguing about this. And I went home that night, I went to bed and I got up in the morning. I was like, that's it. That's what I'm going to, how I'm going to write it. That's what I'm going to say. So that, and so that's what I did. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's awesome. I was actually uh, going to go next into metaphysics meets cognitive science. But since we're on the topic of transformative experience, I would love to hear like the hear you tell the sort of vampire story or thought experiment yourself because i loved it so much in reading the book 
<laughs> so, um, all right. So to uh, illustrate the problem for, I mean, for yeah, listeners yeah, who, who yeah. don't know about it. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, one of the reasons why, by the way, I, I like the vampire example is that, um, it's intended to bring out, um, the nature of the problem. So the thought is that, um, you're on holiday and you're, you know, touring some medieval castle and you go down to the dungeons and it's kind of dark down there, but it's very cool. And you're kind of looking around and all of a sudden Dracula comes to you and he says, I like the way you look. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> and then he says, I want to make you one of my own. And you're like, whoa. Um, and then he says, look, this is a one time only offer. Um, you've got until midnight, go back to your Airbnb. And if you want to take me up on my offer, leave the window open. If you don't, you know, keep the window shut and leave in the morning and don't ever come back. So obviously it's time to leave the dungeon. You go back to your Airbnb and you contact, you know, like your friends and your family members and you tell them about, you know, this opportunity. And as you tell them about this opportunity, a bunch of them tell you, well, actually I've been meaning to tell you this, but I actually am a vampire. Uh, I've, there are many more vampires than you realize. And I became one, you know, whatever X years ago. And obviously after you get over your shock, the thing you do is you ask them, well, so, okay, like, well, what is it like? Like, is this a choice that I should make? It seems very intense, but I'd also, you know, become undead in some sense, or at least it'd be very hard to kill me. That sounds great, except that I'd also have to presumably drink blood. Maybe I could drink artificial blood. Um, I couldn't be in the sun. And they say, yeah, but you also get amazing new sensory powers and incredible strength. Then you look fabulous and black, you know, like what's not to like? And you say, well, I'm not sure if I want to become a vampire. You know, I mean, is this the kind of life that I want to live? Like, what is it like? And they say, look, I can tell you about it, but there's just no way that you can understand you just got to become a vampire to know. And that's when the conversation ends, right? Um, or maybe you ask them, <laughs> well, what do you advise? And they say, well, I find life to have a meaning, sense of meaning and purpose that it never had before. So yes, everything is very different, but absolutely you should do it. Um, you might question whether that testimony was motivated in some sense. Maybe they, I mean, they could be right that they absolutely love becoming vampires, but maybe something about becoming a vampire kind of rewires you bio biologically so that, of course, now you love being a vampire, even if you weren't sure beforehand. Now, the question is, what do you do? Like, if you're in that situation, you've got till midnight, the clock is ticking. Um, are you going to take up this offer? And the problem is, because you can't, I think of it, I describe it as not in my book, but in some of my, uh, some of my other work is like you face an epistemic wall. You can't, it's like you're, it's like, there's this high, I think of it as like this, there's this kind of like, as though you were facing a concrete wall, like a high concrete wall. If you look up, all you see is gray concrete. And you know that when you undergo this experience, you're going to find yourself on the other side of that wall, but you have no idea what, like what it's like on the other side of that wall, like what the landscape looks like, what people are like, nothing. Um, people tell you, you can hear people saying, oh, it's fabulous or whatever, but then how do you make the decision to leap the wall? Um, and I think that this is a situation that we find ourselves in, in all kinds of, in all kinds of real life contexts. For example, like the first time, if you're not sure, let's say you think you might want to have a child, it's very natural to think about, well, what is my future life going to be like? What would it be like to be a parent? you know, it's a huge responsibility to bring a, a new life into the world. And also it's effectively irreversible. I mean, even if you gave the child up for adoption, you've still undergone this experience. You have this child that's kind of, that you've created. Um, how do you make a choice, an informed choice, if you can't possibly know what it's like um, to be on the other side? Mm -hmm. So that's the question. Um, and to frame it in decision theoretic terms, if you're trying to choose the option that's going to maximize your expected value, which is a combination of how likely that option is and um, it's and um, how valuable it is, if um, one way to do that is to try to assess, well, what is 
the value of that option. And if we think of the term of the, uh, if, if we think of that kind of value as involving the subjective character of the lived experience, yes, there are other kinds of values, but that's an important one. And if you can't assess that, then there's a way in which basically um, this option is undefined. Like the, the expected value of that option is undefined. And that's a problem because mm -hmm. obviously then you can't have defined, have a defined choice. And before we talk about a solution, I read a, a paper by Elizabeth Harmon. You probably, you, I'm guessing that you know the one that I'm talking about mm -hmm. where she disagrees with you or mm -hmm. objects and mm -hmm. says, I mean, she also had a child and mm -hmm. I think maybe she had very younger, she had a younger sister that she had mm -hmm. to care for. Mm -hmm. She had testimony from friends and family mm -hmm. and she felt that she knew very much what it was going to be like to have a child beforehand mm -hmm. without having had the transformative experience. And then after the fact felt, very much the same. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm wondering if you find the um, the objection that we can know what it's like from testimony mm -hmm. uh, compelling. If that's caused you to revise your views at all. Well, the thing is, I don't think I don't think that Liz found out about what it's like to be a parent, taking what she says at face value um, through testimony. I think she found out by basically standing in a parenting relationship to her, to her younger sister. So, okay. And so, I mean, um, so it's not that you have to officially stand in the, in the parenting relationship. You just have to stand in the right kind of like allo parenting relationship or whatever. Um, see what I don't think happens is I think when people merely babysit in ordinary contexts, they just don't have that responsibility. And the and the, the way that I would describe it now, which is not quite the way I described it in my earlier work, is that there's a kind of preference for another person. Like, and I think of it as like most fundamentally, whose life matters more? Who do you care for more, yourself or this other person? And for me, the attachment that comes through parenting, but it could come other other ways, but I think for most people, it doesn't come other ways until you actually you know, produce or adopt a child just because of the intensity, either the biological facts or which there are biological facts even when you adopt or just the intensity of like this kind of caring relationship this dependency relationship that you find yourself in that until you actually stand in a relation with another person where truly that person's well-being is more important than your own i think there's something that you can't understand i can understand it in theory but I would argue that there's a kind of knowing, like kind of practical knowledge, really, um, that you can only grasp through experience. That's my view. So there's a sense, and so what I argue to, and back to Liz, is to say, look, you had the experience, you just didn't have it in the standard way. Now, we could argue about that, maybe, she, but that's how I interpret. And I interpret her examples. Her very examples are like that. She said, well, I cared for my my my." my younger sibling. Now, if it was just like mere babysitting and when the baby cried, someone else came running, then I would argue that I'm suspicious that there, that, that, that was actually like, that, that actually, that actually happened. But I think from what Liz said that she must've really had that relationship with her younger, with her younger sister. And that's a very deep relationship to have. Um, and I think some older siblings do have that relationship with their younger sibling. So if they allo parent, then they, they have, they're acquainted with the right kind of experience. I have a question about an, another example in your book. So I'm an, I'm an ice cream connoisseur, mm. and I recently had a, a pint of ice cream. Have you heard of salt and straw? No, but um, now I have to. <laughs> I would like recommend. Yeah, I think, I think it's the best ice cream. It's out of Portland, but they have shops mm -hmm. pretty much all along the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of specialty flavors. And they had a flavor for this Halloween that had <clears throat> chocolate-covered crickets and, like, toasted mealworms in it. And I looked at this pint, and 
I did not know if I wanted to eat this. I had no idea what it would taste like. I asked the people behind the counter uh, if I should eat it, and and they said they liked it. You just have to not think about the fact that it's bugs. And it reminded me of you have an example in your book about the durian fruit, mm-hmm. uh, where you you can't really possibly know mm-hmm. what um, it's going to taste like before you try it, since it's so foreign. And I'm wondering if. This example is the example of the durian is different in kind from the vampire example or the pregnancy exam- example or just different in degree in that it it's just less and in, less intense or there's less weight on the decision. The main thing I want to know is were the mealworms fresh? They were toasted. Uh huh. Okay. They were toasted, and oh. I think. But were they fresh when they? They might have been toffee. Ooh. Okay. And toffee mealworms. Because dried out mealworms. <laughs> actually, I've had chocolate covered mealworms in the past. Dried out mealworms oh. are terrible, but if they're fresh. <laughs> were they candied, or like you just ate them for? No, um, I just. It's a long story. We... Oh. <laughs> when you have children, you go to science museums. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was dared to eat a mealworm covered in chocolate. And if somebody dares me to do something like that, I'm going to do it. Um, I think I can tell that already. <laughs> <laughs> so in any case, um, so I, I mean, no, it's a good case. So I, my, here's, here's the way that I want to, I want to, I want to interpret that. So, I mean, I think it's kind of like the durian case, but maybe a little safer, maybe. Um, because if you've had ice cream from this company before, then you think of like, it's like, okay, there's probably a spectrum of different kinds of ice cream, but especially if every kind you've had has been really good, you know, you're going to be like, well, most likely this new kind of ice cream is like this old kind of ice cream, this other, these other kinds of ice cream that I've had. And so even though there's going to be a dimension that's unfamiliar to me, given that they, you know, the flavor profile seems to be consistent with what I like, it's a reasonable gamble. It's still a gamble, but reasonable. The durian fruit, um, if you were just, if someone just said, hey, you want to try this like exotic, you know, exotic from our perspective, Western perspective fruit, um, lots of people from Thailand, um, you know, Southeast Asia love it. And you weren't able to smell or anything like that. But you're like, oh yeah, a new fruit. It would be great. I love fruit. Like, especially if you like, I love fruit. I eat fruits of all different kinds. If you could smell it, you might, like, you might not feel so optimistic if you'd never tasted it, but um again if like you're choosing something that every member of that category has always been positive and so you want to infer that it's going to be positive um so i think it's rational to choose on that basis right it's what's not rational to choose um is if someone says well actually doesn't taste anything like anything the stuff you've had before right or well it is kind of like that other stuff, but it's also really different in another really important way. And that really, that way, that, 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 that flavor can be pretty dominant. So don't expect it to be like the things you've had before. Then you can't say, oh, I'm going to try it because I think um, I know I have enough information about what it's going to be like to taste it. Instead, it's more like a flip of the coin. Mm-hmm. So. so I, I was asking though, how the, the durian example compares to the pregnancy or the, vampire example if those are I see. the same in kind i see or if they are just a matter of degree i see um when you say degree. they're the same in kind there's a sense in which they're all different kind, in they're kind. all epistemically transformative right so they're the same in kind but they're different in degree okay um and here's the thing here's something i'm not sure of i, I think I, I sort of fudged this in various ways because i'm not sure about it i think sometimes an epistemic transformation causes a personal transformation. But I think sometimes an epistemic transformation constitutes a personal transformation. And I think it's just like about the details. When I say I'm not sure about it, I don't, I I think both kinds of cases work. And so I don't want to stipulate something one way or the other. So like think about an epistemic transformation, uh, a tra- a change, something that changes um, um, like some of, some of what you care about, some of your values. Yeah, I think I can think coming to believe in God would 
really change who you are fundamentally. Exactly, exactly. So you undergo this epistemic transformation and it constitutes a personal transformation, just kind of changes who you are. Um, but it could also be that you just like kind of learn something radically different and then that causes you to change like how you view yourself and the nature of the world, like maybe some kind of dramatic scientific kind of revelation or something like that, right? Um, that is not so straightforwardly a constitutive change. It's a causal change, or at least kind of more basically that the epistemic change causes a change in self as opposed to just simply is a change in self. And so I think the vampire case is probably a constitutive case, maybe, depending on what your, your metaphysics of vampire is, vampires are. And so, um, um, but maybe having a child might be more causal. I'm not sure. I mean, the way that I describe it, this kind of reorientation of like kind of fun fundamental values, that probably is a change in, that may, or there's probably a blend there because I think it's a change in self but I think it also just causes you to make a whole bunch of other decisions and iterates out into just, you know, you, 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 you change. There are a whole lot of downstream decisions where you, that, that you make as a result of this change in values and these downstream decisions also change change you causally. So maybe who you partner with or maybe what you do for your career, or where you want to live or all these kinds of things. So hmm. have you, uh, are you familiar with Jorge Luis Borges? Yes. <laughs> the author. Do you know the story, Pierre Menard, author of the Don Quixote? Um, I've read so much. Borges, that um, I may have read it, but I'm not. Uh, uh -huh. Why don't you t tell me about it? Because um... sure, I I think I actually talked about this with Barry Lamb, who I interviewed, because we talked about uh, your your book when we were talking about vampires. But this was just one sort of hypothetical objection that I had to this account, and I'm wondering what you're thinking. But I I relied, I guess, on this. Uh, example from Borges. So the story is there's this person, uh, Pierre Menard, who is really, enam and I'm going to fudge the details yeah. here, he's he's really enamored of the Don Quixote and wishes that he could write it himself. And he sort of adopts the mannerisms, the lifestyle, everything of Cervantes until he like really just becomes Cervantes. And then he then he writes the Don Quixote. <laughs> and this came to mind because as I was reading your book, I was a little bit offended at first because I'm writing a story on vampires Sorry. <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> a, a fiction story. And I felt as I was writing uh, before I read your book that I really had a handle on what it would be like to uh, become a vampire. And I'm I'm wondering if you you just think it's a a totally off base objection to suggest that our imaginative capacity, our capacity for imagination is enough to enable us to em envision what it would be like to have uh, a subjectively, to be sub have different subjective values in this transformative but sense. If I answer, I'm going to offend you now. Like you're going to be mad. At <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't be mad. I <laughs> um, so I think something that's really important with me um, with the vampire case is the change in embodiment. Okay. Um, and so let me, um, I'm going to run an example. Um, it's going to, might make you mad, but I'm going to run it anyway. I'm going to say, look. Um, <laughs> I was joking. I wasn't that, I wasn't bristling. <laughs> I, just, I promise. So, so, so um, I, and one of the, like, so one thing I think is like really salient, like, you know, nowadays is like stuff about gender. Right. And, um, um, some people identify as female, some people identify as like non-binary or just reject gender categories altogether. Um, some people want to reject like, you know, the gender they were assigned at birth and transition. I think that, um, if I were to transition 
to being male. I was, you know, identified as female as birth. I still identify as being female. That that would just change my embodiment, and especially if I um like you know took um took tea and um like had top surgery, did all the things that maybe that 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 I would want to do. I think it would change my embodiment in a way that I don't feel that I can grasp now as someone with a kind of very standardly female body. And that's like not even as radical as becoming a vampire. So that's my announcement. So what I'm saying is, yeah, I just don't think that you, there's like something incredibly important about being a vampire, at least the way that I define vampires. I mean, maybe you have a different story, like the whole thing about all these like amazing new sensory and physical powers, maybe being able to fly, whatever, um, um, changing your species. I think those would be like changes in embodiment that um, would just fundamentally change like the orientation, the re- like our cognitive orientation and the relationship we have to the rest of the world. And there's a kind of, again, like a no, like a, there's a way of knowing that, that without having that embodiment, we lack. And I think it's the same in these more, you know, more kind of uh, contemporary physical ways, which are actually real possibilities for people. I think that's the same, they're in the same kind of situation and they would discover a new kind of knowledge by transitioning. No, I like that answer very much. I think I think your book and your work more generally raises a lot of questions for philosophy and literature. I don't know if there's been much writing on it. But so we, we've sketched out the problem. How was it that you initially proposed solving it or that we approach these decisions where we don't have any rational basis upon which to make them? Yeah. Well, so I don't really have a very good answer, but my answer is, I mean, I'm thinking about this answer more. My answer is first to say, look, I mean, you can just change the way you make a decision. I mean, if someone wants to say, I'm just going to rely on what other people tell me and I'm just going to do it, they can do that. I mean, and, or I'm just going to do what my partner wants. I mean, I think if all you really care about is what your partner wants so that these other options just are like not even salient for you, then you can choose rationally. Um, but for those of us that, okay. you know, I mean, you know, um, I just don't think that, first of all, there's a regress issue there. So like if everybody, no, no not everyone can choose that way. Um, um, yeah. although I do think some people, some people might not want to have a child, but they do it because they, they do it because their partner wants it. Now I am often suspicious about whether there are other reasons as well. Okay. So I think like, um, they think, well, how bad it can it be? They say, or oh well, people t- say that they, you know, like you know, they say they're happy afterwards. Um, but what I say in my book is, um, if we want to make choices authentically, and I think, and um, what I mean by that um, involves having a certain kind of control over who we make ourselves into, and doing so in a knowledgeable way. Um, and if we want to also make decisions rationally, which is by choosing way- in ways that maximize our expected value, we have to be honest about what we don't know. And we also have to be honest about what we care about. If you can't possibly know what your future is going to be like, and if that's actually something that matters to you, and I think most sane people do care about that, um, not everyone, um, then <laughs> I think we do have to reframe the decision. And so it's a bit like, going back to the ice cream case, you know, let's say the cricket and mealworm ice cream, which I really want to try now, by the way, um, sounds like I won't have the chance because it was only for Halloween. Yeah. Maybe it'll be back in a year. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm actually, I'm coming out to San Francisco in March. So I'm going to keep an eye out for the ice cream shop. Um, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Should be fun. Um, what you should do is step back and say, okay, there's a whole bunch of stuff I can't know. Um, maybe the, you know, I'm going to ch- make this irreversible decision. It's going to change. If I choose to make this irreversible ch- decision, I'm basically going to replace who I am now with a new self. And I want to discover what that life is like. You don't do it randomly. Everybody else loves that ice cream. The other, you know, I mean, you see people eating the ice cream and feeling happy with it. Now, 
you might think, well, you know, their taste buds are different than mine or um, the ice cream has a kind of drug in it so that, you know, it makes you enjoy its flavor in virtue of eating it, even if it's actually kind of, you know, would be disgusting if it didn't have the drug in it, something like that. So you might worry about it. And yet you might say, I want to find out what it's like to kind of have that experience. I want to find out. Um, and when I talk, when I think about having a child, for example, it's like kind of very quintessential human activity to reproduce, you know, and it's not for everyone. And I think people have built way too much out of it. In other words, like people who don't have children have absolutely fabulous, amazing lives and have opportunities that people who do have children can't take and vice versa. These are just really different ways to live your life. Um, but if you want to discover what it's like to live your life that way, then, and you recognize that you're sort of leaping, you know, kind of into an abyss, then I think that's a rational way to make the choice. It seems a little crazy, but ultimately I think that's all we're doing anyway. We're just fooling ourselves. Although we're fooling ourselves when we're, when we're not being upfront about that. No, I like, I like those two ways of answering the question a lot. I imagine though that there aren't, I, I like them. I like them, but I imagine that they're not necessarily appealing to traditionally oriented decision theorists. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Are, are there who, who want maybe like a quantitative or a technical solution mm-hmm. to the problem? Have there been other answers in that vein that you've found compelling at all? Well, yeah. I mean, not that I found compelling, but there's certainly been different answers. I mean, um, okay. So, um, so for example, Richard Pettigrew has argued, he's like, look, you can just get the best science, the best testimony and, um, find out what, um, and this requires like assuming that, you know, you're a member of the relevant population and that you can know all of this and you can rely. And also Paul Bloom, I think thinks you can, and, uh, and others, but those are two people that, that kind of immediately come to mind. Um, you can get the information you need and you can make the choice rationally. Now, they don't actually say just that because they both, they also recognize that there's um, an embedded problem. So one problem with transformative experience is that you can't, um, you, you yourself can't assign value in the way that you want to, to try to like to define your choice. And so you, if someone thinks you can rely on testimony, then you can use that testimony to assign value to the choice. Okay. Um, Again, I object to that, but let's just let's just take that at face value for the moment. But there's a further problem, and that is how can you rationally choose to replace who you are if um, what you're choosing is to replace your values with values that are contra- that, that contradict yours? Because that's part of the idea. You're choosing to. It's one thing to like to prefer to have different values. It's another thing to really believe, for example, that. You don't want to have a child. You want to, you really believe that parenting is not for you. And yet you choose to become a parent because like, because there's some testimony that says you'll be happier the other way, even though you yourself don't share that value, that's inconsistent. So Mm -hmm. that solution um, requires a different move. Um, Richard argues that we should make a kind of global decision. He has a book uh, called Choosing for Changing Cells, where he argues that, well, there are all these cells at different times, and what you have to do is kind of take a kind of average of them or something like that. Um, I'm not convinced by that solution either. I don't, for a number of reasons. First of all, I think we like to, we're happy to throw past selves under the bus and we should forget about what they care about. And we're not happy to throw future selves under the bus. Um, but it's, it's an interesting, it's a, it's a decision theoretic solution. Um, I don't actually know of anyone else who's proposed a, a solution t- to that problem. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Well, now though, I would like to go. I think it's full circle. Okay. So now, so we've we've taken a a, a stop at <laughs> transformative experience. But was it these issues of the self that brought you back to science mm-hmm. in the form of? cognitive science because you started out with biology and chemistry but now it seems like a lot of your work is focused on bringing the tools of cognitive science to metaphysics yes so i think what it is is when i was saying before 
but I'm super interested in, in phenomenology with a small, like, you know, with a small P. So like the nature. What is it with a big P? Uh, like phenomenology with a Husserl? big P is like Heidegger, Husserl, Merleau-Ponty, like, a, okay. you know, done in, um, in the grand tradition. The continental yeah, tradition. exactly. Yeah, and yeah. I'm not trained like that. And I also don't have the languages for that. So like, that's just not, not for me. Um, but I care about the questions that were, that, that, you know, yeah, were yeah. raised in that tradition. And I also just care about, I'm, I'm really interested in the philosophy of mind and the nature of consciousness. Um, and I'm interested in the hard problem of consciousness, but I think there are many other hard problems that I'm also, you know, interested in exploring. So, um, so, well, what's the way in? So for me, um, I'm a lot, I'm also, I've also just never really been that into philosophy of language, unfortunately. I think I appreciate it more now than I used to, but it just was not really my thing. And I always felt like I wanted to explore the nature of the mind, but from a more scientific perspective. Well, that leads you right into kind of cognitive science in particular. And I like psychology, but I really like things like vision science and, um, and computation um, because it, there's just something about the precision that really gets to me and it fits with um, my interest kind of in biology. I'm interested also in the neuroscience. Um, and so I'm kind of fascinated by it and it, 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 you know, it's kind of to my taste, I guess. So I thought, well, look, this is a dimension that um, needs to be explored. And the first paper I wrote, uh, the first couple of papers I wrote that connected to all of this were on um, basically uh, our computation, like on how we, the cognitive science of time. Like, so basically, yeah. you know, how we understand um, ourselves in time uh, cognitively and also now a bit computationally. Um, and I And was this experience in the era that you're referring to? Uh, yeah. So actually the first one is, um, I don't remember what the first, the first, <laughs> the first paper is temporal experience. Um, and the second okay. paper is, um, experience in the arrow. Um, and that's right. And so I was very interested in time zero generally and in the physics and the thermodynamics, but I thought, well, actually everyone's talking about the thermodynamics. Some, okay. To back up a little bit more, I also think there are methodological questions in play here. I, when I came to metaphysics at first, I was like, why is everyone so robustly intuiting everything a priori, especially as a scientist? I'm like, this is crazy. Like, you know, these people are building these castles in the air and they don't make any sense. And of course, then I, you know, became an a priori metaphysician myself, but I always worried about the methodological foundations of, of metaphysics in particular. Yeah. And kind of, I, I sympathize with you. Yeah. Yeah. So totally. So I thought, well, you know, you have to like, I think I still think it's, I mean, there's a way in which philosophy just extends past the science. And the more I collaborate, the more I realize that the way that we think and build questions really is distinctive. And it's, you can't just like look at the science and draw your conclusions from that because the way that people are building these scientific models is just really different from how we're thinking about these questions. And we often, the conceptual frameworks that they're using, I think, need development okay um and so the philosophy comes in some sense before the science building even though when you're looking at the empirical work the science the models were already built and so the question like what you can infer from it is kind of limited in some ways um but my thought is that um we need a kind of careful balance between what we can do empirically and understand the way the mind and and, and try to understand as much as we can empirically about how the mind works and then also bring in these a priori questions we could talk more about that but i think that methodologically there's a good way there are some good ways to do metaphysics and then unfortunately there are maybe some not so good ways to do it um <laughs> yeah no there's a there's a there's a whole lot of things that i'd like to talk about <laughs> but first i mean so what were what were those two initial papers about uh on temporal experience and ah, uh, the era the first paper was arguing that look um um there's a kind of inference to the best explanation um that we're making when um when we're arguing for example for like um a B theory of time when we're arguing that, um, could you explain what a B theory yeah. is? So in my paper in temporal, on temporal experience, um, what I, I wanted to take very seriously the sense we have of, um, being in the now, like the sense of nowness or presentness and also the experience we has, we, we have as of change. Right. So, um, and there are questions about like how you're going to 
in precise ways talk about like how we experience change and times passing. But I think it is very important to take temporal phenomenology seriously, right? In how we argue for things. Um, but what I wanted to say was that it's a mistake to think that because we had this experience um, as of nowness or as of times passing, or at least as of change um, that suggests the passage of time, that this um, means that we should endorse an A theory of time, namely that there are these primitive properties of change and passage and nowness. And in my paper, I argued that there was another way we could regard the nature of temporal experience, and that is the, basically the product of our minds. And so it was something about the nature of conscious experience um, and the way that the mind constructed basically conflicting um, properties at times that would create this sense of time's passing and also this sense of nowness. So that paper, um, I think it was really like one of the first papers or maybe, I don't know, one of the first papers to bring um, kind of psychological and cognitive science into play, especially into the metaphysics of time. And I argued that there was this kind of implicit inference that people were making saying, look, nowness and passage is like really there and we have to explain it. We have to accommodate it. And the only way to accommodate it is to argue that these properties actually exist. Um, and, and, and I think that yeah. that inference like fails as soon as you um, look at alternative explanations. Right. And so the thought is there is at least in principle, there was quite a good explanation we could give of uh, the source of our experience of nowness and change that had nothing to do with there actually being these kinds of primitive metaphysical properties out there. Um, I felt kind of bad doing this because I kind of like a theory. Um, some of my best friends are atheists, but you know, what are you going to do? I, I felt like you know, the science. Can, what is a theory? A theory is the idea, as I interpret, is the idea that there are these primitive properties of nowness and passage. Um, these are temporal properties that exist okay. in the world independently of human minds. B theorists argue, no, 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 there are no such primitive properties. All that exists are these temporal relations of earlier than, later than, or simultaneous with. That's kind of a crass, a crass characterization, but that's the basic, so basic idea. Maybe absolute versus relative. Uh, um, no, I would, I would argue I, that's not wrong, but okay. it's also not right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so it's okay. true. Like, okay. So there's a, <laughs> I think what you're getting at is, is um, um, so also many B theorists are also what are called eternalists, like they're four dimensionalists. They think that like, you know, um, in some sense, um, everything, like all times exist at the time to which everything exists at the time at which it's located and things don't go in and out of existence in any way. Um, many A theorists think that, um, things at times change from being in the future to being present to being past. Others exist, argues that the only, argue that the only thing that exists are things in the present. I mean, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole, there are like tons and tons of variations on this theme. So, um, so to keep it simple, I just think of this contrast between people who think that the fundamental temporal, temporal relations are relations of being earlier than, later than, or simultaneous with, and then there's an A theorist who says, no, that's not enough. You also need these properties of nowness and change or passage. Hmm. The, the next paper, the paper on time's arrow was um, just kind of bringing in, um, it's kind of a more, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it was just a paper on temporal illusions. It was basically arguing that, um, again, um, our experience of the kind of dy the dynamic character of change could be a kind of temporal illusion. And, um, and I described how, in fact, a lot of our causal experiences are actually illusions. Like, so, you know, they're vertical illusions. So the thing that people, I think, often don't re realize is that the way that we represent the world is, is highly constructed it's the result of a lot of, term, of of cognitive processing. And some of the things, the ways that we, the representations that we construct are technically illusions, like um, with causation in particular, like when you see one, like one, the cue ball hit the eight ball, and then the eight ball feels like, it looks like it's launched by the cue ball, but that's actually an illusion. I mean, yes, it is strictly speaking launched, but the way that, the way that we see that happening um, simply as a result of the, juxtapos of the juxtaposition of 
these the different constant images conjunction. that we receive. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and so it's true. There is this causation, but it's not like, there isn't this kind of direct representation the way that you might've thought. And we just kind of know that from knowing how the brain works. And what I was pointing out was that actually we have to be quite clear about our arguments for the direction of the arrow and the nature of the relationship between um, the temporal arrow and um, what we want to say about like past, present, and future and thermodynamics and entropy, because there's a whole kind of debate there about like counterfactual dependence and, um, um, and whether or not like there's a fundamental temporal arrow, whether changes in entropy or, um, could be or differences in entropy could be sufficient for um, the direction of time. And what I was saying was, look, don't just look at the physics. And like a lot of these discussions, they were about the metaphysics and the physics. And I was like, look, the metaphysics and the physics are really important, but we also need the cognitive science because there's this whole element of like these judgments that we're making, um, drawing inferences about the nature of the metaphysics or the nature of the world based on our experience. And especially if we're going to bring the physics into play, we should be attending to the cognitive science. So that was what that paper was about. And what were some of the uh, inputs from cognitive science and maybe the, I guess the philosophy of mind that affected your, or played a role in the first paper you were discussing? Um, Well, I mean, at the time when I wrote that paper, I mean, I spent quite a bit of time learning because I didn't really know that much cognitive science, but I did really like the work of Brian Scholl, who's actually my, who's my Yale colleague. At the time, um, I didn't know him personally, but I read a bunch of his work. Um, he's, he's a very talented vision scientist, cal cognitive scientist, and also he's got a kind of a very rich philosophical Kind of orientation like he appreciates the questions and oh that's wonderful yeah that's he's great. great um i mean we don't agree on things we argue i mean we now we teach a class together we teach a graduate seminar together um um where we spend seems to spend most of the time arguing with each other but it's a kind of very kind of like appreciative arguing like you know he'll argue with me and i think he has really good things to say but i don't agree and i think vice versa that's what happens so um and he had written on um on how we experience these kinds of causal illusions and kind of temporal illusions. And I learned a lot from his work. I also learned a lot from reading Dan Dennett's work basically, because Dan has written on some of these things. So those are the influences, but really it was like kind of like sweating through many, many hours of learning. Um, and then hmm. talking, I think I talked to Brian a bit, like I contacted him and got some feedback from him and, and a couple, and you know, I was able to talk to a few people to say, you know, am I completely off the wall here and was able to get, very knowledgeable feedback from people um, to make things better. And also I have a friend, um, Tyler Doggett at the University of Vermont, and he read a draft of the paper and made all kinds of like incredibly brilliant um, comments and the paper was much better because of him, I have to say. <laughs> so That's great. Yeah. And then you mentioned uh, temporal illusions and experience in the era when you were talking about mm -hmm. the eight balls. A, p a paper you've referenced by David Eagleman here at Stanford is called Human Time Perception and Its Illusions. Mm -hmm. Were there any other interesting temporal illusions maybe in that paper or uh, that you didn't mention other than the eight ball? No, actually what really influenced me were causal illusions. So I'm fascinated by okay. stuff on Machat. And, and I was also just thinking about um, um, computer games. So... I mean, if you think about when you when you play a computer game, it's as though you feel like even a very simple one where I don't know, like, you, you know, OK, take I mean, you can play a first person shooter, you can play a traditional computer game where you like have all your all the avatars on the screen and, you know, you know, you're one of them and you're I don't know, you've got a like a gun and you're shooting it or whatever. And you're mm -hmm. immersed in that game. And it's as though you're performing this task and like, you you know. And it's like, you know, your whatever, sorry, this is violent, but whatever, um, your gun shoots like, you know, some something. That's just how most computer games work these days. It's like, you know, you have various kinds yep, of yep. weapons, sadly. <laughs> you know? so, um, so you're using your weapon and all you're really doing is seeing a bunch of images on a screen. Actually, it's just like different lights, like, you know, like different kinds, you know, and, and, and yet yeah, yeah. you process that as though some something is causing something else right and you're racking up points or whatever it is and i was like wait a minute 
you know, that's a causal illusion. Like the software, think of it this way. There's like a deep, like the software is creating um, a series of images on the screen. And in, in what you do then change, then creates a, a, like different images on the screen. And you see that as a kind of causal connection. And there is a deep causal connection, but it's not directly between the images on the screen. That's just how you experience it. And that was what actually... Mm -hmm. Um, I thought, oh, analogously, the same thing could be happening with our temporal illusions. It looks like you're writing uh, two books now, one on subjective metaphysics and one on who will I become. Yeah. So what are what are those two books? Yeah, well, they, I think it's become one book, I have to say, although um, maybe that's just the trauma of writing a book because like today I was like, why do I put myself through this? Why do I write? Why, why do I write books? Writing books, every book I've written, this is my third or fourth book, and every book I write traumatizes me. Um, I don't know. It's just so hard. And um, so I was originally thought I would write this trade book talking about transformative experience. A trade book is a book that's like written for a non philosophy audience and usually with a like um, larger press, one, you know, like Norton or Doubleday or whatever. And, um, and I thought, well, I'll write a book that talks about the ideas I care about in an accessible way. Uh, the, the problem with transformative experience is that was not written as a, that was written for philosophers. And so I didn't write it. I mean, non-philosophers read it, which made me really happy, but also they kind of didn't understand why I was like going into such annoying detail into all these arguments and like, you know, <laughs> um, fussing around about decision theory and stuff like that. Um, Cause I, um, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll write a, a book that's not targeted towards philosophers, but explains the ideas in a way that is like, you know, maybe a bit more accessible and interesting. Um, but then I realized I didn't just want to repeat myself and I was super interested in the nature of the self and the world anyway. And so now I'm just writing this book and I'm not quite sure what's going to happen to it. Um, and it is about, it's about the nature of the self and the world. That's what transformative experience is about ultimately too. I just think that the decision-making problem, like the vampire problem really brings out, you know, why you should care about who you're going to become like, you know, and, and what some of the questions are, but, so, oh yeah, sorry. What are some of those questions? Well, um, so one question is, um, you know, what does it mean to have, like, to reinterpret the world? Like, when you have an experience that changes how you think about things, um, like, let's say, you know, you have a child or you become a vampire or you're deaf and you get a cochlear implant, um, it's going to change the way, like it's going to change your relationship to the world in various ways. And it's because it changes how you, how you know things about the world and what you care about. And I want to explore basically philosophically what that amounts to. Um, and also why it's meaningful. And so the book talks about that. Um, I'm also, very interested in how, when we construct ourselves, how um, this relates to questions about the nature of persistence um, and also how it relates to questions about um, possible selves. And that involves questions um, involved that, that, that raises issues about modality. Um, it raises issues about how we regard possible variations of ourselves, how accessible those um, different possible selves are and whether they, and accessibility relations with respect to possible selves do not necessarily mirror accessibility relations for possible worlds. I think that there's a kind of de se accessibility relation that fails in various contexts. So if, for example, maybe you had, if you had lots of testimony about a different possible self, but you, you could not imagine yourself as being that way. There's a sense in which you have access to that possible world where you're an individual in that world, but you lack a certain kind of day say access. So you can't imagine yourself first personally 
having those properties, but then you could describe yourself or be described third personally as having those properties. So I see. you see, so I'm sort of trying to identify these different kinds of questions and explore them. Um, and it also connects with some questions about self-deception and um, well, I could say more, but that's basically, so the book is, the book talks about transformative experience quite a bit, but it's really more about these, what I take are these epistemological and metaphysical questions about the nature of the self and this, the relationship between self and world and, um, um, in, and also between different possible selves. Okay. Okay. Neat. And then in the, the interest of time, uh, two last questions. One, I love the ascot that you're wearing in the picture on your website. And I was wondering if uh, fashion has always been important to you. Um, it has. Um, thank you. That's an, an, an MS scarf. Um, <laughs> and um, it's pretty. It's I have pretty. to. I have to say, I'm going to just admit that's my vanity here. So, um, this past um, November, I uh, was invited to. Um, there was a. There's a. Was a contemporary art fair in Turin, Italy. And it's a big art fair, like I don't know, a couple hundred exhibitions or galleries exhibited. I think I'm not sure. Maybe it was, I don't have not. I was just. It was a convention center filled with them. And they themed it on transformative experience. So I got to go and um, um, and part of what they did was they said, hey, um, maybe come, so you're gonna come for three days, give a talk on Saturday, but come on Thursday and come meet, like tour some of the exhibits, let's talk about art and some journalists are gonna come. And I said, okay. And then I realized as I was like getting myself uh, packing or kind of getting myself ready to, to go to them, like. Oh my God, this is an art fair. These are journalists. Like this is Italy. I care about fashion. I have nothing to wear. So I went to housing works in Chelsea, New York. Um, I was living in Brooklyn and I um, found a, like, and, and I, and I, um, and I found a whole bunch of clothes and I went to my partner and I was like, what about this? What about this? And I found all these like um, vintage pieces and bought a whole bunch. Like, and I was like, okay, I put a couple outfits together, um, borrowed, borrowed his tie and um, I could send you a photo if you want. Um, and um, and and sure. like, he's got a couple outfits. Okay, so I show up um, in this outfit, um, and um, and I'm like, oh my god, they're gonna ask me. About, I don't know anything about art, you know. And I said, you know, I don't know anything about art. I know a transformative experience. And they said, it's fine. Um, and so we had these interesting conversations. But actually, like, and and the, one of the curators for one of the exhibits, like, was super interesting. She took me all around. We talked about it. And then we had to go meet with these journalists. So I'm like, and they said, oh, here are some journalists. They're like, they're interested in art and fashion. And I thought, oh, I'm in turn. I'm like, there were a lot of journalists and they had like a lot of fancy equipment. And I thought, oh, well, I guess, I guess there's, I guess, like, I, I guess the magazines in, in Turin have, you know, um, have a lot of money. Anyway, they interviewed, I had these, inter I had these interviews and they asked me lots of questions and there were lots of photos. And then that night, um, I, my work, like I was covered in like Vogue Italia, L architectural digest, Rolling Stone. Like they weren't just like oh, that is so cool. journalists, like from the local paper, you know, <laughs> it's like, so I got my photo in Vogue, um, Vogue Italia, that is, is awesome. actually like, it's like, that's like Vogue, Vogue, basically the French and Italian Vogue magazines are the ones I care about. So, um, and, and it wasn't like a pinnacle of your career, dressed me, sorry. Sorry. Pinnacle of your career. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like, forget about like all this philosophy <laughs> stuff. I made it into book. So anyway, anyway, so I was quite pleased about that. So yes. So, and I think what I was pleased about was that um, I had put my outfit together with like, you know, a quick shot, a quick visit to housing works um, rather than being like officially dressed up or made up or anything like that. That was the key. Very cool. <laughs> and then the last thing, uh, again, just for my personal curiosity one of the things that I suffer from and that makes me a not ideal podcast host is that I speak very monotonously, whereas you're easily the most like dynamic speaker I've, I've had on the podcast so far. I'm wondering if, has it always been that way or did you practice to develop <laughs> the sort of uh, 
presence on a microphone that you have? Oh, no, it's always been that way. In fact, I have to restrain myself. So um, because it's okay, well, I mean, it's been a bit of like, you know, again, going back to being um, a female metaphysician back in a time when this wasn't really the done thing, you know, like, um, it's nice of you to say, but a certain amount of like, you know, I mean, you know, you're supposed to have gravitas to be taken seriously. And after a while, I was like, you know what? Fuck gravitas. <laughs> like, I'm just going to do what it is <laughs> I'm going to do. But for a while, it was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't walk the walk or talk the talk. And so, um, you know, but things have changed. The world has gotten better that way. And, and I don't think um, mm-hmm. that you speak in a monotone, I have to say. So. Uh, I think okay, thanks. Talk. Well, I'll take Gravitas if I could get it. But <laughs> anyway, uh, this has been really great. I still have tons of questions, so maybe at some point we could do a part two. That would be nice.